think I like it. <laughs> We're trying to do something different because the brightness of summer has hit and it is so bright off of our, I can't even think of what the names of the bushes are, but they have pink and they have white. And unfortunately, the sun is so bright on the white leaves that it casts such a huge washout effect for my camera that when I put the camera where I'm seated, seated right now, shining that way, it washes out. It's just so bright that it's just kind of like a contrast is off. And because we're not an expensive ministry, <laughs> also known as free, God knows when you hear something that's free, you know that they don't have much money. But, and if they mean free. Sometimes they mean free if you sign up, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But anyways, it's been a challenge, you know, sometimes to just use this camera I have without abusing it because I've knocked it over, I've smashed it, I've knocked it off its stand, knocked it around, poured water on it. I've done all kinds of things this poor camera. And yet, it still works effectively and is effective even in the brightness of the light with the contrast and I can't get the brightness mixed to not do a washout especially with all the background light now of course you know if you wanted to set up lighting and use some uh, diffused screens you know and do the the kind of uh, professional video editing that you can do you know with the uh, I even have it on my computer. I have some of the professional video editing stuff. You could take out all the washout and you could adjust this and fix that and make this and make that. But that's not what we're about, is it? We said we like to talk about, to relate where we are, as we are, the way we are. And one of the things that I've been wanting to do with video is to get the laptop going so that we could just shoot some scenes inside the house probably won't do that here because <laughs> as today's devotion says it looks like more things are happening you know again step by step leading to a different direction and unfortunately that means probably in a long distance state you know far away and I'm glad of that I mean it's like God told me a while ago that you know we're going I mean there's there was no doubt it was like we're gonna go and so people ask me, well, how did you know? I said, well, and I, get, I relate to them the, the circumstance. And usually they're pretty impressed with the circumstance. They're like, wow, that's awesome. That's gone. You know, and I go, yeah, you know, I mean, for me, it's like, you know, on the outside, I share with them the joy. And I go, yeah, it was, you know, it was obvious. I mean, that was like, that was the beginning, you know, and, well, part of the beginning. And that was like, that was confirmation, then there was more of this, and then this, and you add it all together, and you come up with, you know, your formula for how to hear God's voice. But the truth is, <laughs> it was a little more direct than that. Because <laughs> you see, with someone like me, because I've heard God speak, it was like, no, that's not exactly how it happened. There was a message one time that said, go, and I said, no. <laughs> And it was like, okay, <laughs> that's obviously God, you know, because whenever God tells me to do something, my first reaction is, oh, oh no way, uh, uh, I'm not going to. Because I know better. I know what's going to be involved. I know the circumstances. I know the situations. I know more of the revelation than what I let on. Because the, the challenges that you face when you are willing to be used of God, sometimes they're, you know, like pretty serious. Kind of like the guy in the book of Acts who sat down and said, you want me to do what, Lord? And God said, I want you to take in this guy. And he says, uh, what guy, Lord? You know, Saul. Uh, but Lord, I heard he kills people. <laughs> Not such a good idea, God. You know, I think maybe you want to reconsider this, you know. Isn't it true that he kills people? And of course, God didn't answer so he takes him in and prays for him, you know, and Saul's blind, you know, and he takes care of him for three days. Saul basically eventually recovers his eyesight. Never really hear much about the story after that. You know, the guy's kind of, you know, God's moved on with him and done something else, probably. But that little part is a great insight into how do you know it's God? Probably because you don't want to do it. <laughs> the first reaction, usually, in my personal experience with my Father in Heaven is, 
Uh uh. <laughs> That's my normal answer to whatever God tells me to do. No way. Uh uh. <laughs> you pick someone else. You know, and I'm grinning usually when I say it because usually it's like, yeah, I know. Okay, I get it. And then gradually God wins me over because he'll give a teaching after teaching after teaching on it, you know, and why you should, how you should, where you should, and just how much of a benefit there is and all the different things that are going to go on. And, you know, and it's kind of neat, you know, for me in my relationship with God to see that and to be reassured that when I go, I know to go. Because I'll be honest with you, when you get there, it's usually worse than you think. <laughs> Challenging. Because when you've been a Christian a long time, it's not just, you know, smooth sailing. I mean, sure, there's ministries that have that kind of like, you know, oh, well, we contacted them, and they got a hold of them, and they did this and that and the other thing, and we went and we had a wonderful time, and we enjoyed ourselves. Uh, you know, praise the Lord. You know, that's good. I'm, I'm glad for you. you know, there should be those kinds of, I like to say, uh, uh, training missions that take people out of their comfort zone and let them experience something in a cross-cultural environment that causes them to reach out and step out of their own personality and their own formula of what they think a person is to meet someone else in their need and to minister to them according to how God would send them and direct them. And a lot of times when you step out of your culture into another culture, you experience that. And that's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. I think people should do that. I honestly think that part of discipleship should be taking someone out of their comfort zone and moving them into a different environment, especially overseas or into another country. I mean, at least on a short-term mission, you know, like a week or a month or whatever. But you see, that really isn't what a missionary is. A missionary goes somewhere and lives <laughs> and makes a living and has to live and exist where he's at as he is. Paul, being a tent maker, had to go to places and make his living as a tent maker while he did the work of the ministry. In the book of Acts, we see that. Later, we're told that different churches that he started participated and gave to him down the road, venturing to proffer to him some kind of support that he would use to minister to other people. But... I kind of think that probably if you look closer, I don't think Paul used it for himself as much as he probably used it for other people. Because Paul was a tent maker, but maybe in his old age he kind of took some man for himself. I know for myself, looking at and realizing just this, even 180 from over there to over here, reminds me of just how much I've enjoyed where I'm at. I've enjoyed going to the church I'm at. I've enjoyed just receiving without even giving just hearing and just letting it all soak in and be soaked up and to be filled up you know again with the joy and the, the peace knowing that there are people out there that are living quote unquote a normal life now if I told them that they'd probably say their life isn't normal but then if I told them about my life I'd say now what do you think well you're weird <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so, and because I'm weird, God can take me where he needs weirdos, so to speak. And that's kind of why I got to go, you know, and why I know I'm going. But you know, the thing that I wanted to bring out was that how do you know that it's God's voice? How do you know that God is speaking to you? It just becomes obvious. I mean, it just, as you ask, as you seek, as you knock, as you are open, you have to let God speak to you. Because if you keep choosing not to hear what he has to say, you'll never hear what he has to say. You'll always be interpreting or adapting or trying to make fit something in your life rather than, than let God direct your life. Because that's how you know it's God, is if he's directing your life. The pieces fit. The circumstances will come together. The word will be made known. Then the circumstance then gradually more people will become more involved, more things will begin to happen, and it'll just snowball. It'll get bigger and bigger and bigger to where it's so obvious. And then you go. For me, when I was moving to Jerusalem, when I was moving to Israel, I had to stop where I was at in what I was doing and live in a tent while I worked in a uh, potato fields. I took a summer job working as a potato field truck driver 
in order to earn enough money to get a one-way ticket to Israel. And how I was going to get back? Wasn't planning on it. <laughs> oh well, that's the way it goes. <laughs> one way. And so, sure enough, it was uh, by the end of the season, I had earned my five hundred dollars, you know, and and uh, I had bought a one-way ticket, and I went to Israel, and I lived there for fourteen months, you know, and it was wonderful. I even got a job over there for a while, you know, I was working as a metaphor. And um, in that time, while I was working, then. I ministered and administered as a missionary. I worked in the Calvary Chapel of Jerusalem and I worked in different ministries that were going on there in Jerusalem with the community of believers and meeting other people and helping them wherever I was at. And then at night doing evangelism in places you don't want to go. <laughs> places you better not go. No, no, no. You know, and places you should not go. Oh, no. <laughs> you get killed. <laughs> and trust me, Jewish people will kill you. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but it was in a, in a very orthodox part of the city that you should not be a Sharim, and a uh, uh, city with a thousand gates. But uh, the point being is that the three of us that went there, we were passing out tracts, and it was just things that you shouldn't do because if you did do them, you know, you could suffer persecution. So we did them because we had prayed, and you know, we had basically planned on it. You know, and it worked out. So I like knowing that we can always trust in what God is showing. In other words, we can ask for, like Gideon did, fleeces. We can wait for, like God said, to listen to his voice. We can know that God is speaking to us and ask wisdom from him because he never said that you have to interpret or second guess or play games with whether God's speaking to you or not. He said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. They will not follow the voice of another. Bingo. Don't make up God's will for your life. Don't gift it or don't lift it or don't make it into something it's not. Be what God wants you to be and study to show thyself approved to work for that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, that you might know the word of God, that when he does highlight it to you, when he does inspire you with it, then you'll hear his voice and he will guide you as a whispering in your ear to turn to the left or the right as it says in Deuteronomy or to even speak directly as he did with his son when he said this is my beloved son in whom I will please as he did when Jesus spoke from or as yeah Jesus spoke from heaven to Saul when he said Saul Saul why are thou persecuting me and he says who are you Lord he said, hey I'm, I'm Jesus <laughs> when you persecuted oops hello ding 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 so God's voice God's will, God's direction should be obvious. It should be made manifest to you step by step, revealing itself as you're willing to look for and to understand it. In other words, you have to start someplace, and the start has to be willing to have ears to hear what the Spirit says, or eyes to see what God reveals, or even a heart that's open to let God in so that He can begin the work in you to know him personally and intimately and have relationship with you. Because I'll be honest, some of you out there are probably sitting on your hands, you know, going, God never talks to me, I don't get nothing. And God's probably saying, excuse me, you got your fingers in your ears, not under your dear ears. <laughs> You're going around going, God never talks to me. Well, yeah. <laughs> and he never sees me. You know, it's like, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. I hate to say it, but God is blunt. It's more like see no God, hear no God, speak no God, you know, because you just flat out haven't asked. God said, Lord, ask. ask me, you shall receive. He said, seek me, you will find. Knock, the door be open. I'm making it obvious to you. Hey, it ain't kismet. You know, it's not monopoly. You know, it's not kind of like, you know, tic-tac-toe, we'll put them in a row. But it's me as God revealing to you as creation what I'm doing in revelation revealing myself and that's what your quote unquote relationship is all about if you're not getting to know God better I question whether you're getting to know God at all and whether you know God at all because Jesus said it and made it blunt hey my sheep hear my voice man you know they won't follow the voice of another you, you know you got to get to a place where you're listening 
You've got to get a handle on this idea that you're caring enough to pay attention to what I'm saying. You kind of like got to talk to me so that I can talk to you, and you've got to listen to me just like I listen to you. You know, kind of like what we talk about, you know, mano y mano, face to face, you know, I'm in your face, you know, talk to me, dude, get a grip, reality check. Well, that's what God is. God is not a made-up idea that, you know, you can play with and you can say with and you can, you know, run out and do your own thing. No. As a matter of fact, the scriptures are pretty clear. He says, God is not much. What's so bad? So what? That's how you're... In other words, he's not. He's not someone that you just deal with and say, pretending like you're going to get away with murder, because you're not. You're not going to get away with murder. You're not going to get away with sin. You're not going to get away with doing your own thing. As a matter of fact, he makes it clear you're going to go to hell if you don't do something about it, because you want to go to heaven. You've got to do something about it. In order to get from one place to the other, you've got to do something about it. And he's already made the way to do it. He made it simple, made it clear, made it straightforward. Follow me. Jesus said, follow me, and, you know, you'll inherit eternal life. Follow me, and I'll give you, you know, the keys of the kingdom. Follow me, and I'll give you peace. Follow me, I'll give you joy. Follow me, I'll take care of you. Follow me, I will make you disciples of men. Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me, I will give you eternal life. Follow me. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. He just keeps saying what he'll do for you if you follow him. So, when the Spirit of the Bride say, come, and you read it so many times in the Scripture, you kind of wonder, what aren't you getting here? I mean, get a grip here, you know? Take a second look, or a third, or a fourth, or a fifth, and start having serious conversation with God. Take a long sabbatical, so to speak, of your own intellect and say, look, this guy on the web keeps telling me that, you know, I can hear you speak, so God, you know, I'm, I'm tired of this messing around stuff. Let's get a reality check and say, you do it or don't do it, or else I'm giving up on it, because I quit. Bingo, God will speak to you. I'm serious. You ask Jesus into your life. I mean, just don't even, you know, I mean, you know, you get all this religious mumbo-jumbo, you know, formula, theological premise and predicates and all these other ideas that people tell you that you got to have, that you don't even know what the heck you're doing when you do it. So you just kind of do it anyways because you can't figure it out and you're just wondering, what the, you know, pardon the expression, but we say, what the hell are they talking about? And of course, I agree with you. What the hell are they talking about? The hell, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about not going to hell. How do you get to heaven? Bluntly, that's what God wants to talk to you about. And so what he does, he says, look, you got to you got to understand some things you won't understand. So you just got to take some of these things with a grain of salt and say, okay, and do it. Try it, you'll like it. Do it. I mean, I'm just telling you that there's a certain amount of this idea they call faith that you got to do it in order to get it. In order to get it, you got to do it. So the only way you're going to get it or do it is by doing it. So you just got to do it. Just like they say in sports, just do it. You see something where they say, you know, you pray a prayer, you know, and you ask God if he's there, you know, and you come into your heart and, you know, you ask for forgiveness and you ask him to take over your life. Do it. I mean, come on. Go to a Billy Graham revival, go to a Greg Lord revival, go to a Vineyard revival, go to some, you know, Joel Osteen revival. I don't care where you go. Just do it. But do it. If you get on your knees right now and you ask God to, you know, take over your life, hey, God will do it. But the point is, you won't know it unless you do it. And then once you do it, follow through with it. Because following through means you're going to go somewhere to talk to someone about what it is that you think you've done or you haven't done and you want to know more about it. So go do it. Talk to someone about it. Find out. There's plenty of people on the internet. There's plenty of people at your church. There's plenty of people in your community. I mean, there's plenty of people that are false and righteous. There are plenty of people that are true and wrong. There are plenty of people around that you're going to get a handle on some of it. I mean, come on now. You bought a used car and got ripped off, haven't you? You know that life is full of all kinds of experiences. But just do it because now you're talking about something more important than a car. You're talking about your life. And the time is for a reality check for you to get real with your life. And that's why if you want to hear if there is a God, get real with it. Get real with Him. Because God's already gotten real with you. He's already proven His truth and His facts. He said, look, you're not going to get any other sign. I'm not going to give you any more signs. You know, I've given you plenty of signs. You know, I've done this and I've done that and I've done the other thing. I'm only giving you one. My son. And that's it. It's over with. No more. No more playing games. I'm done with it. I've had it. I'm going to judge the world, so guess what? I'm going to judge it on the basis of my son. I gave him. He took care of it. Everything is prepared. Now, you deal with it. And that's what God says in salvation, is that you need to deal with it. 
The reality is, Jesus said, come unto me. I'll take care of you. I will take care of your sins. I will take care of your stupidities. I will take care of your idiocies. I will take care of your ignorance. I will take care of your spirituality. I will take care of your soulful experience. I will take care of your drug addictions. I will take care of all of it. I will take care of it. If you give it to me. So are you going to give me your life? If not, hey, get out of my face. Quit wasting time. You're just going to hell, so go play. You know what I mean? Go eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. I mean, that's the reality. I mean, that's what you're saying. So, if you want to hear his voice, then you do have to make the choice of one or the other. You can't go and play games pretending there's no God. When you know, pardon the expression, I'm going to say it one more time, damn well there is. You knew it way back when, and you're just playing games with it, pretending like you don't know. You'd know. You know, and you know at home and alone when you're dying or you're sick or wherever that you cry out to, guess what? I hope there's a God. Please help me. You know it and I know it. Why fake it? I know. Fake it, fake it, fake it, you know, and then just hope that there's no God. It doesn't work that way. Reality check is going to come in real quick and you're going to pay. But yo, what yo, going to send you, you know where, and that's where you'll go. So, Rather than be where you shouldn't be, which is hell, go someplace where you ought to be, which is heaven. Which is determining within yourself that you're going to spend the time, make the time, and invest the time to find out how to hear God's voice, how to know His will, how to know there is a God, how to follow God all the days of your life. Otherwise, got news for you. Yes, you're headed for hell in a handbasket. And it doesn't take any effort at all to get there. Just a matter of time, and you'll be there. And you'll be all alone. You'll be weeping, you'll be gnashing your teeth, and you'll be burning in the lake of fire. And it sucks. Big time. Don't let anyone tell you they've been there. They haven't. <coughs> the only one that came close was Jesus, and he wasn't there. He looked over and said, hey, there's a gulf between where you are and where I am, and no one can cross over it. And so guess what? You're suffering, and no, even if someone should be raised from the dead, people will not believe. That's what Jesus said. So I got news for you. Don't think that you're going to believe because of something people say. You need to prove it to yourself today. You need to find the reality of what you're doing with your life and what you're going through and say, is this really all there is? I mean, you know, kind of like, you know, I, I make a comfortable life for myself and then I die. Wow, that's it? Checkout time? Huh, man, I better party hardy while I'm young, because man, when I'm old, the party hardy doesn't feel so good. You know, I mean, if you really are stupid enough to believe that. But the fact is, you know better. God said that every man, woman, and child, put it bluntly, in the book of Romans, but every man, woman, and child has a knowledge of God inside them. Some kind of inkling that, no, oh, eh, hmm, eh. something's bigger than they are. Something's greater than they are. Somehow they know there's a God. And from that moment on, they either change it to what they want it to be, or they rearrange it like people say, making up gods. Well, they make up gods. But the reality is, when it comes to Jesus, you know based upon every single person that fights it, Every single person that argues about it, there's got to be something different about this Jesus because everybody's got a problem with Jesus, really. <laughs> I mean, everybody keeps talking about him. It's like, man, that ought to give you a big indicator. There's something about Jesus that's different. There's something unique about the Son of God, the Son of Man, this baby born in a manger, this guy that died on a cross, this man who rose from the dead, this one who whoa, went up in the sky and says he's coming back. Whoa, man, there's got to be more to the story than meets the eye, isn't there? And that's why you have to make your own choice. You have to do your own research. You have to figure out your own facts. you got to get it right because you're going to get something right in your face. It's going to be when God decides to roll back what you call the heavens. And he just takes his hand and just peels it back like a sardine can. And you, like one of those sardines, look up and go, Oh. My. God. 
And you think zombies is something? Huh. The book of Revelation talks about that time when no one will die. There will be zombies in the land. And people will try to kill themselves. They'll cut off their own arms and not die. They'll cut off their own heads and not die. They'll slash themselves, gash themselves. They'll crawl under rocks because God will have peeled back the heavens and he's obvious to them. The holy God. And people won't be saying, oh my God, in shock, but in terror. Oh my God. It's God. And they'll be crawling under rocks like cockroaches. They'll be running and fleeing like roaches that they are. Because at that point in time, people aren't crying out for salvation. They're crying out to be destroyed. Because they know how sinful and how wrong and what a bad choice they've made. You really want to try to prove it that way? You really want to go there and wait until you can see God face to face and then try to plead your case? I've got news for you. It ain't going to happen the way you think it is. It's like, poof instantaneous consummation you are not made of the substance that can exist in the presence of a holy God you are made corruptible and corruption is your middle name you are fully corrupted as you are the way you are and should you stand in the presence of pure love stand in the presence of God Almighty you would be totally consumed in the elements that you are made out of spiritually emotionally and physically would just be poof destroyed so that God had to create a place completely absent of his holiness of his love so dark and so desperately wicked or so desperately far away from him that there's no possible presence of himself and his love there that it would feel like a lake of fire that it would consume people because sensory deprivation of the spirit would cause them to burn everlasting in torment because they would be deprived of the very nature of what God is which is love and that's what's really interesting is that creation was meant to be love all of creation was meant to feel love receive love and be loved that's why God made it in the first place he loved what he made and he saw it was good if you really get into the good part from Jewish part I mean as far as Jewish mysticism I'll admit you know Jewish perspective I'll admit you know kind of like eh, you know, yeah, but you know, hey, <laughs> could be. Then you see that God didn't just say it was good. God said, I love it. It is good. Yeah. That's how God said. And God saw it was, yeah. Oh, yeah, man, I love it. Man, I love it. Look at what I created. I love it. Loving it. Digging it. Because that's the kind of father your God is. God is love. And so, when you know that God is love, then you have to reevaluate your Old Testament God as being some kind of cruel and mean taskmaster, wiping out nations and this and that and the other thing and being cruel. And I think you'll find that it's not just a theological idea of, you know, oh, well, they're under the sacrificial system. I think you're going to see if you took love to the extreme and put it back into the scene, you might see it a little differently. I'm just saying, I do. And I look at it from a Jewish perspective and from a Gentile perspective and we put it into perspective from God's perspective. And we put our thinking caps on, you know, and we do our romper room and we look in the mirror and we say, I don't think I got it right. So we take a look again and we go, oh, wow, God's making it clearer. Now in his sight, I can see it a little better. And from his perspective, then we can understand what the reality was at Genesis through Revelation, which is all about the revelation, not just of his son, but of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. The revelation of God. The revelation of Jesus. Because the physical representation of God is Jesus. Whether you know that or not, you won't understand that if you're not saved. But if you are saved, hey, you want to see God the Father? Bingo. Who's the old man in the white hair? Oh. Eyes of fire. Tongue like, you know, sword. Hmm, feet of brass. Wow. That's a different picture of Jesus. Huh. Hmm. You see the throne, you know. Oh. Hmm. That's kind of interesting. Because that which God is a spirit is spirit. And that which God is the spirit of God is spirit of God. And that which is God the Son is God the Son. But I'm not going to tell you you're going to see the Father <laughs> and live. I'm just going to tell you if you want to see the Father, if you see Jesus, you've seen the Father. Bingo. That's about the culmination of it all. 
how that works, I'd love to get into discussion. But since we're talking about hearing God speak, I want you to know a single word that Jesus said, that the Father said, and that the Spirit said to you, that you can know God speaking today. That you can walk away from this revelation, this dissertation, this exhortation, this presentation with one word that you can bank on, that you can count on, that you can take to the bank, that you can invest your soul in, knowing it's God speaking to you today. And I don't care if you're saved or not. I don't care what it is you're doing. I don't care how it is you're living. I don't care where you're at or what you're doing tomorrow, today, or next day, or whatever. One word. Come. That's what Jesus said. That's what the Father said. That's what the Spirit said. That's what I say unto you right now. Come. That's it. Pure and simple. That's all it takes. You want to know God's voice? There it is, right now. You just heard it. God speaking to you. Come. Period. No questions matter. No questions asked. No interpretation needed. No explanation need be beyond that. You have heard God speak. There is no doubt beyond anybody's theological predicate, beyond anybody's theological idealism, behind anything that anybody wants to tell you in exhortation or explanation. I will defy them to the day I die by telling them this is what God is saying to you today. This is what God is speaking to you right now with his voice.